Welcome again, and welcome to those that are watching. And it's so good to be able to see again. You might have noticed the last couple of meetings I didn't have glasses. That's because I lost them. I need glasses to see you folks out there, but not to read. So the other day I was riding in the taxi and I was working on my computer. So as I usually do, I took my glasses off, put them there beside me. When I got out of the taxi, I forgot them. So they dreamt driving away. I have no idea where they are. And somebody, out of the kindness of their heart, provided me with a new pair of glasses. Thank you. You know who you are. And it's good to be able to see again. You never know how much you need glasses until you don't have them. Well, we're going to, this is question night tonight, so hopefully those of you who have questions, had questions, you've turned in your questions. I'm going to start with some questions that came in on the surveys, and by the way, if you didn't yet fill out one of these surveys, then we would like you to do that. And some of you have written questions, number 12. If you have questions or are unsure of Bible doctrines, you can write those, and some, several people did. Someone has said, as a Catholic and a Sunday keeper, and now we know that Saturday is a Sabbath day, do we need not to attend church on Sunday? But this is our traditional church day. Well, we should answer that question from the Bible, right? Where in the Bible does it tell us to go to church on Sunday? There are people that have offered money for one Bible text telling us to worship God on Sunday, to set that aside as a holy day, or one Bible text where God shows us that God has changed his holy day from Saturday to Sunday. People have offered money. I know one man that's offered a million dollars. Of course, nobody's collected the money because there is no verse. What about the Sabbath? Does the Bible tell us to go to church on Sabbath? Well, if you'd like a text, you can put it in your notes. Leviticus 23, verse 3, calls the Sabbath a holy convocation. A convocation means a coming together. So the Sabbath is a day that we come together on. So no, you don't have to go to church on Sunday, according to the Bible. But the Bible does teach us to attend church on Sabbath, Saturday. Someone else has written in on their survey. I am worried because I'm not keeping the Sabbath on Saturday. I am not opposed to the fact that Saturday is the Sabbath, but I'm confused. Is the law of God what saves us? Or do we believe in Jesus and his salvation? If I cannot keep the Sabbath on Saturday, but I keep it on Sunday instead, can I still be saved? Good question. Well, first of all, are we saved by keeping the law or are we saved by grace? We are saved by grace. Does that mean we can break the law then? No, Paul says, in fact, in Romans 6, we are not saved by grace, or we're not saved by works, we're saved by grace. And he says, what then? What, does I, what do I mean? I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. Do I mean that I can break the law? You know what Paul says? God forbid. In fact, maybe we ought to read that. Romans chapter 6. If you want to open your Bible tonight, hopefully you have your Bible. Romans 6, we'll read verses... 14 through 16. Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. By the way, what is sin? Sin is breaking God's law, 1 John 3, verse 4. So Paul says, sin shall not have dominion over you because you're not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? What's Paul say? God forbid, verse 16, and this is the one that often people don't read when they read this passage. Verse 16 says, know you not that to whom you yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So does Paul talk about obedience? Sounds like it. And the question is, who are we obeying? Are we obeying the law of sin? Or are we obeying God? 
No, we understand we don't, we're not saved by our works. We're not saved by keeping the law. But God associates disobedience with unbelief. We saw that from the book of Numbers. So once we've learned the truth, then if we don't do it, we got to be saved anyway. Uh, that would be dangerous. I wouldn't want to run the risk. I've had people tell me, well, pastor, I don't think God cares. And I say, well, that's a risk you're going to have to run. I don't want to get to the judgment. And God asked me, why didn't you keep one of my commandments? And I say, well, I didn't think you cared what, what day I kept holy. Uh, I'd be afraid for that excuse in the judgment. If God does not care and I get to the judgment and God says, I really, really didn't matter what day you kept holy, but I saw your sincerity. You were trying to follow my instructions in the Bible. Welcome. But when I get to the judgment and God says, why did you not keep the Sabbath? And I say, well, I didn't think you cared. God says, well, I wrote it in stone. Put it in my word. Why didn't you keep it? What will be my excuse? So I tell people, I wouldn't want to run the risk. That's a risk. If you want to choose to run that risk, that's your choice. But I wouldn't want to run the risk. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I love Jesus. That's why I keep the Sabbath along with the other commandments. Now, here's another question that came in on the survey. I believe that God wants me to take care of my body, such as not taking alcohol, tobacco, caffeine, but I'm unsure about the unclean meats because it was Moses' time that these unclean foods were barred not to eat. But there's a certain verse in the Bible that tells that Jesus came to earth and he also cleansed these unclean foods. I wonder where that verse is. I don't know where the verse is. And I often tell people, New Testament Christians, saved by grace, eating unclean food, they can still get trichinosis. So if God cleansed the pig, why does he still have worms in him? I'm wondering whether the pig is more unclean now than it was back in Jesus' day. It seems like the animals are getting more disease, so I'd be more afraid to eat the unclean foods today than back in Jesus' day. But if you'd like a text, you can put in your notes Revelation 18. It talks about unclean birds. That's New Testament. So evidently, the clean and unclean foods, that was not changed from Old Testament to New Testament. And I might mention in passing, some people say, well, I thought Moses' law was abolished. Well, did you know there are actually several laws? There, Moses' law included the ceremonial law. And that, of course, was abolished. We don't have to offer lambs anymore, all those types and services that pointed forward to Jesus. They were abolished at the cross. But Moses also had civil laws. You were not allowed to move your neighbor's boundary marker. How about today? Well, if you do it today, you get in trouble. They take you to court if you try moving your neighbor's boundary marker and try including some of his property and your property. You get in trouble doing that. That was Moses' law. So you had the civil laws that, that God gave through Moses. Then you had the hygienic laws, the health laws, where Moses instructed them when they would go to the CR, they had to bury what the results were. You know, you had, two, what was it, two million people, they estimate, that came out of Egypt living in the wilderness. And they didn't have the constructed CRs, so they had to go outside the camp. They used a shovel. And they buried the CR stuff. That was hygienic law. And it's still true today. They had the quarantine. That was part of Moses' hygienic law. And we still follow that today. When somebody gets a, a, a deadly disease, contagious disease, they're quarantined. So the health laws, the civil laws still exist the ceremonial law, of course, was what ended at the cross. Let me move on now to some questions that came in on little cards. And I have several of these. I'm looking at the clock, I'm going to try to pick some that I can get through. Here's one that shouldn't take too long. The Bible speaks of returning tithe. Should tithe be calculated before taxes or after? 
Well, that's a good question, I suppose. When should we calculate that? By the way, what is tithe? 10%, I think. How many of you have heard of tithe? Let me see. Oh, it looks like some, well, whoever wrote the question knows about tithe, and some of, I guess some of us don't. Let me read about tithe from the third book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Leviticus 27, verse 30. Leviticus 27, verse 30. That's the third book in your Bible. This is God speaking. Leviticus 27, 30 says, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or the fruit of the tree, is whose? Is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. Now, I might mention tithe simply means 10%. And it's always interesting to me, most of the churches that today say we don't have to follow the Old Testament, they still teach people that they should return tithes. Interesting. But the tithing principle actually carried over from the Old Testament to the New Testament. But many of the churches that say the Old Testament was done away with, they'll use the Old Testament when talking about the tithe. But let me re read to you the answer to when we should return tithe, before or after taxes. Turn to Proverbs, words of the wise man. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9. Proverbs 3, verse 9 says... Honor the Lord with thy substance. You can just mark these if you like these texts. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So God says, the Bible says we're supposed to return to God first, not what's left. So I tell people, well, before taxes really is when you should return tithe. Let me just read one more text on tithe. And that is from Malachi. Malachi, by the way, is the last book of the Old Testament. And this is the passage that most preachers or churches will use when talking about the tithe. Malachi 3, verses 8 and 9. Actually, we'll read verses 8 through 10. Malachi 3, verses 8 through 10 says, God says, Will a man rob God? That would be serious, of course. Yet you have robbed me, but you say, Wherein have we robbed you? In tithes and in offerings. You are cursed with a curse, God says, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Verse 10, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse. Now here it actually tells us where we're supposed to return our tithes to. Bring you all the tithes into the storehouse. What's that? Reading on. That there may be meat or means, money, in mine house. What's God's house? That's a church. So we return tithe to the church. And then God says, prove me or test me now here with the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I think that many people who return tithe can testify that when they do that, God blesses them. So I see some of you nodding your heads. So the Bible does speak of returning a tithe, and it should be returned actually before taxes. Here's a question. Somebody's asked, does the Seventh-day Adventist Church celebrate the Lord's Supper? Well, the answer is yes. How often? Well, we do it once a quarter. I know some churches celebrate communion or Lord's Supper every week. But then it just becomes a routine, a tradition, a custom that happens all the time. It loses its sacredness. Some only do it once a year. That's probably not often enough. So we choose to do it once a quarter or four times a year. And the Bible actually doesn't tell us how often to do it. If you have your Bible, turn to, to 1 Corinthians 11. We'll read about the Lord's Supper here. 1 Corinthians 11, we'll start with verse 23. If you're taking notes, verses 23 through 28. 1 Corinthians 11. And of course, you can read about the Lord's Supper in the Gospels as well. But I want to read it from Paul here. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 says, Paul says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. By the way, the bread represents what? 
body of Jesus broken on our behalf. And the bread that was used, it was the unleavened bread. Leaven as a symbol of sin. That doesn't mean it's wrong to use yeast in your bread. But when you serve, when the unleavened bread is served at the Lord's Supper, it's without yeast. And then reading the next verse, verse 25 says, After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often, as, as oft, or often, as you drink it in remembrance of me. So Jesus doesn't say how often we're supposed to do it. He just says, as often as you do, you do it in remembrance of me. And the cup, the wine, represents what? The blood of Jesus spilled on our behalf. And the wine that was used was what kind of wine? The unfermented kind of wine, which we refer to as grape juice. Fermentation is a symbol of sin. We know Jesus did no sin. And the reason why some priests, some pastors have a problem with alcohol is they're always using the fermented wine at the communion or the mass. But we should use the unfermented. And then reading on, verse 26, for as often, again, you see, he doesn't say how often to do this. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Now notice verses 27 and 28. Wherefore, whosoever shall... Eat of this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. There is another service that the Seventh-day Adventist Church associates with the communion service, the Lord's Supper. And Jesus himself associated this service with that Last Supper. Anybody know what that service was, is? The foot washing service. Should we partake of the foot washing? Shall we celebrate foot washing? Paul says here that we're supposed to examine ourselves before partaking of the communion, the Lord's Supper. Jesus gave the foot washing to facilitate the examination of self. If you have a problem with somebody in the church, then this is the opportunity to deal with the problem. In fact, I'd like you to turn to John 13, and I want to read this with you, John 13. And as you turn to John 13, let me tell you what, the, what was happening back at that time in the Bible. Whenever you would invite guests to your home, back in Bible times, you always had a servant that would go around and wash the feet of the guests. This was considered an essential act of Middle Eastern hospitality. You always had a servant that would go around, because you understand, they, they traveled by foot. And they would wear these sandals, and their feet would get hot and dusty and dirty. So they would all, whenever you would have guests come over, you would always have a servant that would go around and wash the feet of the guests. When the disciples gathered for that last supper with Jesus, the water was there, the towel was there, the basin was there, everything was was there as normal for the servant to act the part of washing the feet, but there was no servant. Somehow they had neglected to order a servant to come to that last supper when Jesus was with the disciples. And so as they were around the table, they began to realize there's no, nobody's going around washing our feet. And I can just imagine that Peter is looking across the table at Andrew, and Andrew is looking back over at John, and John is looking over at, Bar, at Bartholomew, and Maybe somebody's looking over at Matthew, and they're all thinking this. Not me. I'm not washing feet. That's a servant's job. I'm not washing your feet. They had just been arguing about who would be the greatest in the coming kingdom. So what happened? Well, if you know the story, we're going to read it here from John 13. John 13, verse 4 it says, he, that's Jesus, he riseth from supper, laid aside his garments, or sort of like taking off his outer coat or cloak, and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. This was the servant's job. Who's doing it? Jesus the master. You talk about a rebuke to the disciples' pride to see their Lord and Master down acting the part of a servant. What a rebuke was that to those disciples. Notice reading on, it says, verse, verse 6, Then cometh he to Simon Peter, 
And Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? That's a servant's job. You're the master. Are you going to wash my feet? Notice Jesus' answer. Verse 7, Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do you know not now, but you will know ha afterward, hereafter. Verse 8, Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. I can't allow you to humiliate yourself like this. Notice what Jesus says. If I wash you not, you have no part with me. So you can begin to see the importance of this service of foot washing. And then if you read on down, it says, verse 9, Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. I need to be completely washed. I've had people ask me, Pastor, after I'm baptized, if I get baptized and join the Seventh-day Adventist Church, what if I sin after I'm baptized? Do I need to go back and get rebaptized every time I sin? No. The disciples already belonged to Jesus' church, the true church back then. But they had some jealousy in their hearts, some envy toward one another, which is sin. They needed to have that cleansed. And so Jesus, as he washed their feet, he cleansed them of the issues of jealousy and pride. It was sort of like a miniature baptism. And so I tell people who have joined the Adventist church, when you are baptized or rebaptized, you come in the church, you don't have to be rebaptized every time you sin. The foot washing service symbolizes the cleansing of those little sins that creep into our lives unintentionally after our baptism. But reading on, verse 10, Jesus saith unto him, Peter, that is, he that is washed, you can see baptism symbolized there, he that is washed needs not save to wash his feet, but it's clean every whit. And you are clean, but not all. Of course, referring to Judas. Go down to verse 13. John 13, 13. Jesus says, you call me master and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. Verse 14. If I then, your Lord and master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. There's a command. One command. Then you read on verse 15, for I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Second command. Verse 17, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Third command, three times Jesus commanded his followers to practice this service, foot washing. So what should we do? We should do it, right? If Jesus says it, we ought to do it. And I might mention there are some churches, not a lot, but there are some churches that practice foot washing, and the Seventh-day Adventist church is one of them. What usually, let me just explain what we usually do. When we have the communion service, which happens usually each, each quarter, once a quarter, then we will have, before the communion, the foot washing service. And if I have a problem with some brother in the church, I go to that brother, I say, you know, brother, it seems that something's come between us. We've been estranged. Have I said something to hurt you or offend you? And if I have, he tells me, I say, brother, let me, forgive me. And we kneel down, we ask God to forgive us. And then I say, brother, let me wash your feet. So I wash his feet, he washes my feet. Now what's happened? We're heart to heart again. And the ladies, you know, generally the men go to one area, the ladies go to another area. The ladies, I tell ladies, lady, don't look for your favorite friend to wash feet with. Go look for that lady you've been gossiping about and ask her if you can wash her feet. You see, we're supposed to examine our hearts before we partake of the communion. As if we got undealt with sin in our lives, then Paul says we take the, the body and the body and the blood of the Lord to ourselves unworthily. We are sort of taking damnation upon ourselves. So we're supposed to deal with those issues. So that lady you're not getting along with, you go and ask her to forgive you. You wash her feet. After the foot washing service, the whole church comes back together. And what's happened in the church? The whole church is now at one. Put away any problems. And by the way, if you have no problem with anybody in the church, does that mean you don't have to partake in the foot washing? No, we still partake in the foot washing. Foot washing actually symbolizes at least three things. It symbolizes service. We serve one another, washing one another's feet, the men with the men, the ladies with the ladies. And then it symbolizes humility. It's pretty humiliating to kneel down in front of somebody and wash their feet. In fact, sometimes it's referred to as this, the service 
or the ordinance of humility, because it is sort of humbling. But thirdly, and I like this one the best, it's a symbol of cleansing. I always look forward to the communion, the Lord's, Lord's Supper, and the foot washing to know that any mistakes that I've made since the last foot washing are symbolically cleansed away. So when you understand the significance of the foot washing, you always want to partake in that symbol of service, symbol of humility, a symbol of cleansing. And we practice that in the Seventh-day Adventist Church along with the Lord's Supper. If you have other questions concerning the communion, Lord's Supper... We'll take time to answer those. There was another question here I wanted to take some time on. Here it is. Did not Jesus say that he would build his church on Peter? <laughs> well, that's a uh, text you can read in Matthew, and I actually put together some slides for that, and maybe I can show those here. Matthew 16, if you want to follow in your Bible... This is where it talks about Christ. Well, at least it looks like he's building his church on Peter. But let's look at it in its setting here. Matthew 16, we're going to read verses 16 through 18. <clears throat> Matthew 16. Let's actually start with verse 13 to get the setting. Matthew 16, beginning with verse 13. When Jesus came unto the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? They said, Some say that you are John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Verse 15, He saith unto them, But whom say you that I am? And no, Peter, he was always so ready to speak. Peter responds. Now, verse 16. Simon Peter answered and said unto him, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Verse 17. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And here's the text that brings in the question. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Explain that, please, huh? It, did Jesus build his church upon Peter? Let me show you this passage from the... This is my e-sword, which you can, by the way, get for free off the internet, e-sword.net. And you can see how that with e-sword, you can look at the original meanings of the words. So we're looking at Matthew 16, 18, and you can see where the word Peter is there. In the Greek... It's the word petros, which is a rock or a piece of rock. You can see there it says piece of rock. Jesus says, you are petros. And upon this petra, rock is petra, I will build my church. And the petra is a mass of rock, a huge immovable boulder. So you see the, the, see the difference? Did Jesus build his church on the Petras or the Petra? The Petra. Was Peter the Petra? No, he was the Petros. Well, who is the Petra? Let me give you some cross-references. This is from 1 Corinthians 10, 4. You can mark these, by the way, in your notes if you like. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4 says, And did all drink the same spiritual drink? For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock, Petra, that's what the Greek word is there, Petra, that rock was who? Peter? No, it wasn't Peter. It was Christ. So Christ is the Petra. All right, here's what Peter says. This is from 1 Peter. If you want to know what Peter himself said. 1 Peter 2, verses 6 through 8 says, Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. There's the Petra. Elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is become the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock, there's the word, Petra, and a rock of offense. By the way, who was that rock of offense that was offensive to the Jewish leaders? That was Jesus. He was the stone that they had set aside. 
a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Let's go back now to Acts. You can mark this in your notes also. Acts 4, verses 8 through 12. Here's Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost. Again, notice what Peter says. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, you rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, this was the man that was healed, who was a cripple, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, there's the Petra, Jesus Christ, that's who it is, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you made whole. This is the stone. Who's the stone? Jesus. He's the Petra. So who is the rock that the church, Jesus built his church upon? Himself. Not upon Peter. Peter says, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. What is that name? Jesus Christ. And that's why you read in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. Mark down this verse also. For other foundation. What's the foundation of the church? Is it Peter? No, it's Jesus. For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is who? Jesus Christ. Let's go back to our passage in Matthew 16. Jesus said the gates of hell should not prevail against it, against the Petra. I have a question. Did the gates of hell ever prevail against Jesus? No. Did they ever prevail against Peter? Who denied Jesus there at the trial? It was Peter who did. In fact, you can read right on in chapter 16. Let's see if we can find it here. Verse, uh, go down to verse 22. Verse 21. Matthew 16, 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go up unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him. This is Peter. Not the Petra, the Petros. This is the Petros. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, say it, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, that you're going to have to go up and die. Be that far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. But he, Jesus, turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me. What's it say? Get thee behind me, Satan. Who was speaking through Peter at that moment? Satan was. So did the gates of hell ever prevail against Peter? Yeah, they did. But they never prevailed against Jesus. Even though he died on the cross, that was just a momentary victory for the devil. Because Christ came forth from the cross. It was the statement of Peter, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That was the statement upon which Christ built his church. Upon this rock, that foundation, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Upon that statement, that faith, Christ built his church. Now, let me show you something that's even more interesting. This is from St. Hilary, very highly acclaimed Catholic theologian of the early centuries, he said, quote, This one foundation is immovable. That is, that one blessed rock of faith confessed by the mouth of Peter. What was the rock? Thou art the Son of the living God. The building of the church is upon this rock of confession. Thou art the Son of the living God. This faith hath the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What this faith shall loose, our bind is bound and loosed in heaven. Now let me show you something else. This is from the Catechism. 1994 Catechism. Moved by the grace on the, of, the Holy, be, of the Holy Spirit and drawn by the Father, we believe in Jesus and confess, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Matthew 16, 16. On the rock of this faith confessed by St. Peter, Christ built his church. 
So even the church of Rome admits that it wasn't Peter that the church was built upon, but rather it was the confession of Peter, you are the Christ, that was the foundation of the church. And that's why the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Well, anyway, we took a little bit of time to answer that one. There's another question that I have that actually I don't really have the time for today. I think I've got through most of these. But here's one. I'd like to take time on maybe next time we answer questions. Please, and write this down. This will be interesting for you to look up and read. Please explain. Somebody's asked, please explain John 20, verse 23. Write it down and look it up. You'll end up with a big question mark in your mind. Please explain John 20, verse 23. Doesn't this text mean that a priest can forgive sin? Well, click save on that question in your mental computer. We'll come back to that in our next question period, which well, I think we'll probably do on this coming Saturday morning. We're going to end the question time now, and uh, we'll have a little more music. Then we'll go over to our topic for the evening.
Thank you, ladies. And welcome again to Revelations of Prophecy. Those of you that are watching in other parts of the Philippines, we welcome you to our program. Those of you that are here, a warm welcome to you tonight. We're going to start with the quiz from our last lecture. Anyone need a quiz card? If you're watching, you can pull out a piece of paper and do the quiz with us. Revelations, Woman on the Moon. Question number one is a question. According to the Bible, how many true faiths are there? According to the Bible, how many true faiths are there? Write down a number for the answer to number one. Number two is true or false. The best way to find God's true church in these last days is to ask our parents and other relatives. True or false? Just write your answer down. We'll go back through in a moment. The best way to find God's true church in these last days is to ask our parents and other relatives. Question number three, true or false? God's true church will be following Jesus Christ teaching the Bible, and keeping the Ten Commandments. God's true church will be following Jesus Christ, teaching the Bible, and keeping the Ten Commandments. Number four, true or false? The true church pictured in Revelation 12 is like the church in the days of the apostles, teaching and practicing the same doctrines, same things, that Jesus and the apostles taught and practiced. True or false? The true church pictured in Revelation 12 is like the church in the days of the apostles, teaching and practicing the same things that Jesus and the apostles taught and practiced. Final question is a question. God says his remnant church would be one that preached the everlasting gospel to the whole world. What two churches are working in almost every country today? If you were here last night, you know the answer. God says his remnant church would be one that preached the everlasting gospel to the whole world. What two churches are working in almost every country today? Let's now go back and see how well we did. Question number one. According to the Bible, how many true faiths are there? 38,000? One? Yes, the answer is one. One true church. Number two. The best way to find God's true church in these last days is to ask our parents and other relatives. Ah, oh, that's false. Number three, God's true church will be following Jesus Christ, teaching the Bible, and keeping the Ten Commandments. What's the answer? That's true. Number four, the true church pictured in Revelation 12, is like the church in the days of the apostles, teaching and practicing the same things that Jesus and the apostles taught and practiced. What's the answer? That is true. Final question. God says his remnant church would be one that preached the everlasting gospel to the whole world. What two churches are working in almost every country of the globe today? Catholic Church and the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And you may remember from our last meeting, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the fastest growing church in America. That's according to the news this year. But it's growing twice as fast outside of America, other countries. How many got 100% on the quiz? All right, looks like most of you did. We're going to sing this song as they pass the baskets. You can drop in your quiz card with your score, your questions. We'll answer more questions this coming Sabbath. And also next Wednesday, or your prayer requests, and while they pass the baskets, this will be our song. Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble
that song, don't you? Tonight, your lesson is this one, number 22, The Other Woman. We looked at the pure woman last night. Tonight, we'll give you the lesson on The Other Woman. And they may give you, I think I told our registration table, they may give you two lessons. And those of you that are doing the lessons, you want to make sure you get all 27 of them done before we finish this seminar so you can get your diploma. Tomorrow, there's no meeting here in this site. It might be a meeting in your site if you're watching in some other place. The one-day delay. Our next meeting will be Friday, Modern Prophets, Visions, and Dreams. And I'm going to share my conversion story on Friday, how God changed my life. Then Saturday, what time? 10 o'clock. Our topic will be Satan's Trojan Horses. And we'll start again with some questions. Saturday night, history's most tragic story. I think of all the topics in my seminar, this one is my favorite. And you'll enjoy it as well, that's Saturday night. Let's stand now and sing our theme song, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Stand with us if you're watching in some other venue. Heavenly Father, thank you again for bringing us here to this place to open the Holy Bible. We pray you'd open our hearts and speak to us, teach us the truth. We do uplift to you in prayer those families that have been affected by the flash flood of last night. We pray that you'd bring healing and help to those affected. Tonight we ask for your spirit here in this place. And in every place where this program is being watched. Bless us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated, please. Our topic for tonight, Mystery Babylon, Revelation's Scarlet Harlot. There are an estimated 38,000 different Christian churches, groups, or denominations globally, and yet there's only one Jesus and there's only one Bible. And that leads many people to the question, why are there so many different Christian churches? Have you ever asked that question? I've often had people ask me that question. One thing is obvious, the devil is hard at work today mixing truth and error together. And that's primarily how he deceives religious people, Christian people. The devil, he knows he's not going to lead us into things like worshiping rats. Did you know that in India there are some people who worship rats? Probably not going to get too many people here to worship rats. So what he does, he mixes truth and error together. The devil doesn't care if you're following 90% truth, keeping nine commandments, or 95% truth. As long as you're stuck on a little bit of error, he knows that ultimately he'll destroy you with that. So remember, the devil's most effective agent, agency, or way of deceiving Christians is by mixing truth and error together. But let's answer the question. Out of the 38,000 different churches, how many can be right? One. Let's read it again. 
Ephesians 4, 4 and 5. Read with me. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And by the way, the body represents what in the Bible? The body represents the church. Colossians 1 verse 18 tells us that. So the Bible says there is one body or one church. How can I find that one true church? I look for the Bible identifying marks for the true church, and then I look around to see what church meets those marks. And we learned in our last lecture that the best book of the Bible to find the identifying marks for God's end time true church is the last book of the Bible, Revelation. Revelation has two women in it, and we learned that a woman in prophecy represents what? A church. When a church is faithful to her husband, who is the husband of the church? Jesus Christ. When she's obedient to Jesus, faithful to his word, that church is pictured in prophecy as a pure, virtuous woman. When a church is not faithful to her husband, adopts worldly traditions, worldly teachings, worldly practices, makes compromises with the world, that church is pictured in prophecy as a harlot woman. And we learn that a harlot in prophecy always represents an apostate Christian church. Not talking about pagan religion. We're talking about Christian religion. A harlot in prophecy always symbolizes an apostate Christian church. A church more interested in being popular, being fashionable, than being biblical. Are there churches like that in the world today? Oh, yes, the world's full of those kind of churches. And they claim to be worshiping Jesus. We learned, however, yesterday from Revelation 12, the pure woman, true church, the foundation of the divine system is the authority of God. The word of God, the love of God, the law of God, and the teachings of God. That's the foundation of the divine system of the true church. But then there is this other woman, the other woman. In Revelation 17, her name is Babylon. The foundation of the Babylonian system is the authority of man. The word of man, the works of man, the law of man, and the traditions of man. Unfortunately, this woman has to be what? Has to be a church, because a woman represents a church. But rather than having God's word as its foundation, it has tradition as foundation. Claiming to worship the Lord. And there are a lot of people that do that. In fact, notice what Jesus says in Mark 7, 7. That's easy to remember. Mark 7, 7. Jesus says, How be it, in vain do they worship me. Who are they worshiping? They're worshiping Jesus, but he says it's what? It's vain. Why? Because they're teaching for doctrines the commandments of man. If I'm keeping the commandments of man instead of the commandments of God, I could go to church every week. I could sing. I can pray. I could put a lot of money in the church, and I could still be lost if I'm keeping the commandments of man instead of the commandments of God. Let's read verse 9, same chapter, Mark 7, verse 9, Jesus speaking. He said unto them, full well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. Are there churches that do that today? Reject the commandment of God so they can follow tradition? Yes, the world is full of those kind of churches, and they are symbolized in Revelation as this woman that's called Babylon. Let's go read about her. Revelation 17. How many of you did your homework for tonight? Let me see your hands. All right, I see just a few of you. Must the rest of you forgot, huh? What was the homework? Read Revelation 17. Well, if you raised your hand for that, you got an A. You're an A student. The rest of you, well, I'll let you grade yourself. <laughs> we'll have to do it in class. Revelation 17, and I might mention in passing, we won't get through this entire chapter tonight. We'll look at the first half of Revelation 17. I do have a study on the last half of Revelation 17, but we won't have time in this series to present that. If you want to ask me sometime about the last half of Revelation 17, I can share with that with you, perhaps, individually. We'll just get through the first half tonight. Revelation 17, we'll read verses 1 through 6. 
Verse 1 says there came, by the way, put your ribbon here, Revelation 17, if you have your seminar Bible, because we're going to spend most of our evening in this chapter. Revelation 17, 1, there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, come hither, come here, I will show unto you the judgment of the great whore that sits on many waters, a whore that's a harlot or a prostitute. So this is a woman that's not faithful to her husband. She's called a harlot or a whore, verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. See, she's not faithful to her husband. She's off committing fornication, adultery with these other men, the kings of the earth, this church here, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication, verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand, what? A golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was a name written, what's her name? Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Or I was amazed, John says. We, first of all, we know that this has to be some church. Because a woman represents a church. But she's pictured as a harlot. Not only is she a harlot, she's a drunk harlot. There's only one thing worse than a harlot, and that's a drunken harlot. I've often said there's only one thing more embarrassing than a drunk man, and that's a drunk woman. Well, I've had drunk women come to my seminar. It's an embarrassment. But this woman, she's drunken with what? She's drunken. Well, let's read verse 6 again. John says, I saw the woman drunken with what? With the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. What a picture. Well, the question, of course, is which church does this woman symbolize? It has to be some church because a woman represents a church. We're going to put together tonight some clues as to which church this is. If you're taking notes, you can mark these. The first clue comes from verse 1. The Bible says this woman, this church, sits on many waters. What's water symbolized in prophecy? Well, since we're here in Revelation, let's read it. Revelation 17, 15. And he said unto me, the waters which you saw were where the horse sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So this woman, she sits on many waters. That would have to be many nations, many languages. This would have to be then, number one, a universal church. Our first clue. Number one, this is a universal church. So I put that as number one. I, some time ago, I looked up the word Catholic in the dictionary. You know what Catholic literally means? It means universal or general. I thought that was interesting. So number one, this is a universal church. But not only is this woman seated upon many waters, she's sitting on a beast. What's a beast represent in prophecy? Beast represents the kingdom. If we can understand more about the kingdom, it will help us to understand more about the woman who's sitting on this beast. Go down to verse 9. Notice the clue we find here from verse 9. Revelation 17, verse 9 says, And here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Seven mountains, seven heads, seven mountains. The New International Version of the Bible says the seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. Who can tell me what place in this world is situated on seven hills? Rome. Rome is referred to as the city of seven hills. So this would have to be number two, if you're taking notes. A church that received its seat from the ancient Roman Empire, because she's seated on, seated on seven hills, seven mountains. So she must be a church that once got her seat from Rome. Was there a church that got its seat from Rome? Here's what history tells us. This is from Labanca, professor of history at the University of Rome. He said, quote, 
To the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his what? He gave his seat to the pontiff. End of quote. Another statement. This is from Stanley's history, page 40, which says, quote, The popes filled the place of the vacant emperors of Rome, inheriting their prestige and titles from paganism. Constantine left all to the bishop of Rome. The papacy is but the ghost of the deceased Roman Empire sitting crowned upon its grave, end of quote. So the Bible pictures this woman sitting on a beast. History pictures this church sitting on the grave of the ancient Roman Empire. So number two. This has to be a church that once got its seat from the ancient Roman Empire, pagan Roman Empire. But there's more to our picture. Revelation 17, 9 says the seven hills are seven heads or seven hills on which the woman what? Sits. Sits is what tense in the English language? Present tense. So this woman, present tense, this church, present tense, is sitting on seven hills. Seven heads, seven hills. So number three, this has to be a church then that is based in the city of seven hills. A church based in Rome. But there's more to our picture. In Revelation 17, we have a woman riding on a beast. A woman represents what? A church, a beast represents what? A kingdom. So what do you have then? You have a church-state union where the church is riding on the state. She's getting her power, her support. She's being carried by the beast, the state. But she is in control. See, the rider is the one who guides the animal, the church, the woman. She's sitting on the beast. So she's being carried by. She's getting her support from... The beast, but she is in control. Union of church and state. So we'll put for our fourth clue, this would have to be a union of church and state because you have a woman riding on a beast. A union of church and state based in the city of seven hills. When you begin putting these clues together, it becomes very obvious what God is identifying here in Revelation 17. Where? Let me back up and ask you this. Where should a church get its power and authority from? From the state or from where? From God. But don't miss this. Whenever a church turns away from God or the word of God or the law of God, that church always loses the power of God. And whenever a church loses the power of God, it will always eventually turn to the state for power and support. And the end result of every church-state union is religious intolerance. Persecution for those that don't go along with the official approved religion. And that's why in Revelation 17, verse 6, we read, let's read it again, Revelation 17, 6. And I saw the woman, woman represents church. I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I was amazed, John says. So number five on our list, this has to be a persecuting church because she's drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs. Did you know that Rome itself estimates it put about 50 million people to death during the Dark Ages? It was the year 2000 when John Paul publicly apologized for what happened during the Dark Ages. Here's an amazing statement from the book, The Great Controversy, page 23 which says in the 13th century was established the most terrible of all the engines of the papacy, the Inquisition. Have you ever heard of the Inquisition? Oh, if you've heard of the Inquisition, make your blood run cold. Terrible things that they did. In their secret councils, Satan and his angels controlled the minds of evil men. While unseen in the midst stood an angel of God, writing the history of deeds too horrible to appear to human eyes. Babylon the Great was drunken with the blood of the saints. The mangled forms of millions of martyrs cried to God for vengeance upon that apostate power. Have you ever heard of the book Fox's Book of Martyrs? It's an old book. You can still get, by the way, you can get it for free from Esword. 
But you don't want to read the book before going to bed because you'll have nightmares, the terrible things that the Inquisition did during the Dark Ages to the heretics, the Protestants that didn't go along with the official church state religion. Now, here's what's amazing. The Inquisition still exists today. Did you know that? It has a new name. I got this right off the Vatican website. Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And it says the Congregation, I have it there in big bold print so you can read it. The Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith was originally called the Sacred Congregation of the Universal Inquisition. So the office of the Inquisition is still open in the Vatican. It has a new name, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. And for about 25 years, there was a German cardinal by the name of Joseph Ratzinger, who was the head of the revived office of the Inquisition with its new name. Here is from the Cardinal Ratzinger Fan Club website. It says this, <clears throat> Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger is head of the Catholic Church's Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, or used to be called the Inquisition, whose mission is to promote and safeguard the doctrine on the faith and morals throughout the Catholic world. As Grand Inquisitor, note that word, Grand Inquisitor for Mother Rome, Ratzinger keeps himself busy in service to the truth, correcting theological error, silencing dissenting theologians, and stomping down heresy wherever it may rear its ugly head, and consequently has received somewhat of a notorious reputation. Ratzinger. He has been called God's Rottweiler. <laughs> He's been called the Enforcer. But notice it says here he stomps down heresy. What part of your body do you use to stomp with? Your foot. If you stomp on heresy, might you get a little blood on your shoes? Now he has a new name, Ratzinger. It is Pope Benedict the 16th. What a heritage he has. And he has a favorite color for shoes to wear. You see, his, see the picture there? His shoes. He almost always wears blood red shoes. Here's a close up of those blood red shoes. And there is a reason why he chooses that. In fact, I was just looking just today. Time Magazine has an, a photo. A gallery on the significance of the Pope's wardrobe. And it says there, virtually every article of clothing worn by the Pope, by Benedict, carries meaning and history. So everything he wears has a meaning. And he wears blood red shoes. Why? All right, here's from NPR News. This is a secular news of cast there in America, radio. In fact, I heard this myself, and I was so amazed at what I heard. I went to their website, and I actually got the documentation for this. This was in 2008, April 17, 2008. In the documentary, All Things Considered, it says this, Lawrence Cunningham, professor of theology at the University of Notre Dame, that's a Catholic university, considered the master of Catholic trivia. That's Lawrence Cunningham offers more insights on why the pontiff favors the color, the color red on his shoes, in a conversation with Michelle Norris. The color red commemorates the blood of martyrdom, the shedding of blood, end of quote. Isn't that amazing? The head of the office of the Inquisition for some 25 years, now he is the pope, and he chooses to wear blood red shoes. There is a lot of symbolism in that. And that's why the Bible says that this church would be a persecuting church, drunken with the blood of the saints, and that's even symbolized in the color of the shoes worn by the leader of this church. Well, let's notice something more from verse 4, Revelation 17, verse 4. It says, And the woman was arrayed or dressed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations, filthiness of her fornication. So she's dressed or arrayed in purple and scarlet. Watch this. 
There's the purple. And there's the scarlet. I don't know if they call themselves cardinals because they wear scarlet or not, but anyway, that's the color. And there you have the purple and scarlet in the same photograph. Those are the official colors of the Church of Rome. Purple and scarlet. So our next clue, number six, this would have to be a church whose official colors are purple and scarlet. And those are the colors, official colors of Rome. But there's more in the picture here. Revelation 17 verse 4 says, she is decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. So we'll put as our next clue, number seven, this woman, this church is decked with jewels. What does that mean? Well, a couple things. First of all, this would have to be a very wealthy church. The wealth of Rome is beyond computation. Rome owns, owns more gold, more real estate than any other kingdom or entity on the face of the globe. In fact, if you were to the, visit the Vatican, you would be absolutely astonished at the wealth, the gold you'll find all through the Vatican. So this woman, is, she's decked out with all this gold and jewels. But what else might this mean? Decked out with jewels. I've often had people ask me, Pastor, is it okay for Christians to wear jewelry? And I'm not going to take the time to answer that question tonight. But let me just give you one text to see if this woman is in obedience to the Bible. This is from 1 Timothy 2.9. You can mark it in your notes. 1 Timothy 2.9 says, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair, that's when they used to weave gold in their hair, or gold, or pearls, or costly array. The Bible says not to wear that. Is this woman, Revelation 17, obeying the Bible? Obviously not. Notice this statement. From A. Nampon, Catholic doctrine as defined by the Council of Trent, page 157. Quote, tradition, not scripture, is the rock on which the church of Jesus Christ, church of Rome, is built, end of quote. Tradition, you can see that's why God symbolizes it, decked out with all these jewels in disobedience to the Bible. Here's an amazing picture from the Vatican. This is actually from the Jesuit church there in Rome. You have a woman, typically a woman represents what in religious artwork? A church. She's stomping on two men. And by the way, those two men are two Protestant leaders. But notice in the bottom of the picture, you see a little angel with a book, tearing pages out of a book. Can you guess what book that is? That's a Bible. This is a deliberate symbolism. And that's why Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, back in 1992, he's now the Pope, he said this, the Roman church... The Roman Catholic Church is wiser than the Bible, the Word of God, and is capable of contradicting it. End of quote. Rome says there are two sources of truth. One is the Bible. The other is tradition. Of these two sources, they say tradition is the more important one. So we actually will set aside the Bible for tradition if it becomes a, an issue of which to follow. So you can see it's even symbolized there in the artwork in Rome. Let's go back to verse 4 and notice something else. This woman has a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So we're going to put as our eighth clue, this woman has the wine cup of Babylon, which, by the way, the world's been drinking out of. I want to show you an actual photograph of the wine cup of Babylon. Do you see it there in the photograph? It's right there. There is the actual wine cup of Babylon. Let me give you a close-up. This is with the current Pope, Benedict. Again, you see him with the wine cup of Babylon. That's the literal wine cup of Babylon. Here's something even more amazing. This is a photograph of a Vatican coin. You understand the Vatican has its own money. Because it's an independent nation, and I actually have one of these coins in, at home. Somebody gave me one of these coins. Notice on the back of this Vatican coin, you have a woman holding a cup. Exactly like you see in Revelation 17. Rome knows the symbols of Revelation and uses those symbols. A woman holding a cup. 
You see it in Revelation 17, and you see it on the back of the Vatican coin. But what's even more amazing, what is inside the cup? Can you see what's inside the cup? The sun. How interesting. All right, here's another coin, Vatican coin. This was the coin that was minted after the Lateran Treaty. This is when Italy gave back to the Vatican its property. So in 1929, they minted this coin. Notice you have a cup. There's the wine cup of Babylon. And inside the cup is what? The sun. How interesting. The Bible says that this cup is full. Note that word full. Full of what? Full of abominations and filthiness of fornication. So in other words, it's a... It's a, full of a confusing mixture of truth and error. And that's one more deadly, right? When you mix truth and error together, that's much more dangerous. You might be wondering, did pagan teachings and practices creep into the Church of Rome in those early centuries? Yes. Let me prove that to you from some statements. This is from a Catholic cardinal, Cardinal John Henry Newman. In his book, Development of Christian Doctrine, page 372, we read, We are told by Eusebius that Constantine, in order to recommend the new religion, by the way, the new religion was this Christianized paganism. Constantine, in order to rec recommend the new religion to the heathen, transferred into it all the outward ornaments to which they had been accustomed in their own religion. The use of temples, those dedicated to particular saints, incense, Candles, holy water, processions, the ring in marriage, turning to the east, images at a later date, all are of pagan origin and sanctified by their adoption into the church. So even this Catholic cardinal says a lot of this stuff we brought right out of paganism. We brought it into the church. Here's another statement. This is from the book Church History, Century 2, Chapter 2, Section 7 which says, quote, Christianity became an established religion in the Roman Empire and took the place of paganism. Christianity, as it existed in the Dark Ages, might be termed baptized paganism, end of quote, because it was more pagan than Christian. All sorts of traditions and symbols crept into the church. Let me show you an example. You're looking at a photograph of a rock relief. This is a rock carving of a priest to the god Dagon. I don't know if you've ever heard of the god Dagon, the fish god. You can read about the god Dagon in the Bible. Judges 16, 23, 1 Samuel 5, 2 to 7, 1 Chronicles 10, 10. The fish god Dagon. But what's interesting, as you look at the priest, he's, by the way, he's sprinkling holy water here in this carving. But notice what he is wearing. He's wearing the cape, the fish cape, and on his head, he has the open fish's mouth, the fish mitre. This is the priest to the fish god, Dagon. Now watch this. Did that creep into the church? Take a look at these hats. There's something fishy about those hats. That is the open fish's mouth. Just like the priest to the fish god Dagon once wore. You don't trace this back to the disciples that were fishermen. You rather trace it all the way back to paganism. The open fish's mouth. That's why I say there's something a bit fishy about those hats. So we recognize that this cup is full of a confusing mixture of truth and error. Christianity and paganism. It's a cup full of false doctrines that the world has been drinking out of. And that's why there's so much religious confusion today. Drinking from the wine of Babylon. Wine makes people confused. You might wonder what are some of the false doctrines in that cup of false doctrines that the world's been drinking out of. Well, you could probably list some of them. And we're going to list a few of them here tonight. One of the false doctrines in that cup of false doctrines would be sprinkling instead of the Bible form of immersion for baptism. You may remember that we learned baptism, according to the Bible, represents death, burial, and resurrection. So in baptism, we place the person beneath the water for a moment, representing what? Death and burial. The next moment we raise them up out of the water representing resurrection to a new life in Jesus. 
That's the Bible form of baptism. And all churches, including the Roman Catholic Church, used to baptize by immersion. But then a compromise crept in. Sprinkling came in. Rome began sprinkling. And then other churches drinking from the wine cup of Babylon, Lutheran church, some other church, Anglican church, so forth. They also sprinkle people even though that's not the Bible way for baptism. Another false doctrine in this cup of false doctrines would be image worship. The ancient world was full of image worship. They worshiped their, they had all their gods and goddesses, and they were brought into Rome and renamed. The Greek goddess Ashtaroth, queen of heaven, was brought in and renamed Mary, queen of heaven. You're looking at a photograph here of the statue of Jupiter, the god Jupiter. You can see there above his head the nimisk, associating him with the sun, the worship of the sun. This is a statue of the god Jupiter. Here is a side view of Jupiter. You can see he's got his votive finger showing his power over the world. Notice the solar blaze there in the background. You know Jupiter, anybody know where Jupiter sits today? He sits in St. Peter's Cathedral. He's been given a new name. St. Peter, anybody that knows the history of this statue knows that that is the original statue of Jupiter that was brought into Vatican, renamed Peter, St. Peter. And millions of Catholic people go by and kiss the toe of Jupiter thinking they're kissing Peter's toe. In fact, that toe has been kissed so much, Jupiter has lost his toe from too much kissing. There's a picture. You can see his toe has been kissed away, disappeared. He lost it from all the affection. The Bible says, mark this in your notes today, Psalms 2 verse 12, kiss the sun. Not talking about the S-U-N, not the, not the sun that we see in the sky, but Jesus. Rome has turned millions of people away from Jesus to statues of Jupiter and other saints. And it is God's will to turn people back to Jesus. And I might mention there are many, many Catholics that are turning back to Jesus. They're worshiping Jesus, confessing their sins to Jesus. They won't bow before an idol anymore because they know that's not biblical. Catholics do that. Actually, bowing before an idol is breaking one of the commandments. Which one? The second commandment. And by the way, the second commandment is the commandment you will not find in the catechism. It's been taken out of the catechism. You know why? Because of all the idols, all the statues. Here's what God's word says, Exodus 20, verses 4 and 5. You, God says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. Deuteronomy 4, God says, You shall not make any graven image the likeness of male or female. God says, Don't make any graven images and bow down to them. So image worship would be one of the false doctrines in this cup of false doctrines. Another ingredient would be Sunday sacredness. This is a major ingredient in this cup of false doctrines. And many churches have drunk from that cup of false doctrines. And they also celebrate Sunday as a holy day. Where did Sunday come from? It originated not with the resurrection of Jesus, but long before that. In fact, even the Church of Rome tells us that. This is from the book, The Catholic World, page 809, which says, quote, The Son was a foremost God with heathendom. Hence the church, Church of Rome, would seem to have said, keep that old pagan name, Sunday, Day of the Sun. It, Sunday, shall remain consecrated, sanctified, and thus the pagan Sunday, dedicated to Baldur, sun god, became the Christian Sunday, sacred to Jesus, end of quote. Came right out of paganism. Even Rome admits that. Here's a statement from the Catholic Record magazine back in 1893. Sunday is founded not on scripture, but on what? On tradition and is distinctly a Catholic institution. What did Jesus say? Full well, you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your own tradition. And even Rome says Sunday is based not on the Bible, it's based on tradition. Here's a statement from another spokesman for Rome, C.F. Thomas, who said, 
Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act. That's changing Sabbath, Saturday, to Sunday. And the act is a what? A mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. There you have the mark of the beast. And as we learned already, no one has the mark of the beast yet. Only when it's enforced by law, civil legislation is passed. Then those that believe in keeping Sunday holy, they get the mark where? In the forehead. Those that comply, they're willing to do it. They might not even believe in God. They get the mark where? In the hand. And we saw already that that issue is very close. God says, what does God say? Read with us. Remember this Sabbath day to keep it holy. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. We learn that the Sabbath is God's seal. It has the three elements of the seal. The name, Lord thy God. His title, creator. His territory, heaven and earth. The Sabbath, we found out, is the seal of God. And we also found out the Sabbath is the memorial of creation. When you set aside the memorial of creation, the sign of creation, what happens? Watch this. Time magazine, 1996. The Pope says, we may descend from monkeys. How do you like that? I kindly disagree with the Pope on that point. <laughs> I trace my origins not back to the monkeys, but back to God the Creator. Did you know, by the way, that for decades evolution has been taught in Catholic schools? Well, you can see why. Set aside the Sabbath, the sign of creation, then you'll wonder, where'd we come from? Well, maybe we came from the monkeys. Sunday sacredness, one of the main ingredients in this cup that the world's been drinking out of. Let me show you something else that's amazing. Here is another statue in Rome. You have a woman. Typically, a woman is symbolic of what in architecture? A church. Notice she has her foot upon the world, showing her dominance over the world. But what is amazing is what she is cradling in her arms. Let me give you a close-up picture of what she's cradling. What is that? The sun, a deliberate symbol of a church system that is cherishing the traditions and practices of solar worship, including the day of the sun, Sunday. That's where it comes from. You're looking at a photograph here of the world's largest solar wheel. There are the eight spokes of the solar wheel. You can see in the middle the solar cross with its cross, and in the middle of that is the obelisk. And by the way, here's what's even more amazing. That obelisk once stood in front of the solar temple in Heliopolis, Egypt, the center for sun worship in Egypt. That obelisk was transferred from Egypt to Rome and set up later by the order of Pope Sixtus V. That's history. A pope who named himself Six set up that obelisk pointing up to the, to the sun. How amazing. Solar symbols. Well, I could share with you a lot more, but we'll move on to the next false doctrine in this cup of false doctrines, and that is the doctrine that the soul is immortal. And by the way, what I'm sharing with you tonight really is just a review. You've been learning all these things in our seminar, so you're, you know these false doctrines. Here's what the Watchman magazine said back in 1940. The pagan doctrine of the immortality of the human soul crept into the back door of the church, Church of Rome, in the early centuries. End of quote. The Bible says, what's it say? Ezekiel 18, 4, the soul that sinneth, it shall, it shall die. And we learn from Ecclesiastes 9, 5, what's it say? Read with us. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead... They know not anything. That's what the Bible teaches. We learn the Bible teaches the dead are asleep. At least 53 texts, the Bible tells us that. The Bible teaches the dead are in the grave. Jesus said so. John 5, 28 and 9. Peter said so. Acts 2, 29, 34. The Bible teaches the dead know not anything. Where's the text? Ecclesiastes 9, 5 and 6 and 10. In Psalms 146, verse 4, the Bible teaches the dead do not return to their homes. Job 7, verses 9 and 10. Job 16, 22. That's what the Bible teaches. 
So we understand that the doctrine that the soul is immortal is really a false doctrine. However, that false doctrine leads to another false doctrine, and that's the doctrine that God is going to torment the lost for all eternity. Because if the soul is immortal, where do you put the souls of the lost? You have to put them in into an eternally burning fire, which gives people a picture of God as more cruel than Saddam Hussein, more evil than Hitler, because those men, even though they tortured people, the people eventually died. When they died, they were out of their suffering. But people think that God will keep the wicked alive in hell for all eternity just to torture them. What a picture of God. Not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says, Malachi 4 verse 3, You shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be what? Ashes under the soles of your feet. God's going to turn the devil to ashes and turn the wicked to Ashes, not going to keep burning. We learned already that God has never promised eternal life to the wicked. Right? If you want eternal life, here's how you get it. John 3, 16, read with us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not, should not what? Perish, but have everlasting life. Those are your choices. You either perish, cease to exist in hellfire, or you have everlasting life with Jesus. Well, those are a few of the false doctrines in that cup of false doctrines. We could probably add many more, but we've looked at some of the major ingredients. We know that there's only one church that meets all eight of these points. Number one, a universal church. Number two, a church that received its seat from Rome. Number three, a church based in Rome. Number four, a union of church and state. Number five, a persecuting church. Number six, official colors, purple and scarlet. Number seven, deck with jewels. And number eight, the wine cup of Babylon. There's only one church that meets those eight points, and that's the church of Rome. And this is in no wise speaking against Roman Catholics. There are many Roman Catholic people that love the Bible who are confessing their sins directly to Jesus, that don't go along necessarily with all the traditions of the Church of Rome. So this is not an indictment on Catholic people. And I want to say something in favor of Catholic people this evening. I appreciate Catholics because Catholics believe in obedience. They obey the church. Protestants? Hmm. Protestants, they won't obey the church. They won't obey God either. They always come up with these excuses why we don't have to obey God. Shame on the Protestants. At least Catholics believe in obedience. And the Bible teaches obedience. Praise the Lord. This woman has a name. What's her name? Let's go back and read it. Revelation 17, verse 5. Revelation 17, 5. Upon her forehead was a name written. Mystery what? Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Her name is Babylon. Babylon, you may remember, was the first universal empire. And the word Babylon literally means confusion. So God calls this woman confusion. And when you have 38,000 different churches, that is confusion. God calls it Babylon. But this name is a family name. Because this lady is the mother of harlots. What's it say there in verse 5? Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. To be a mother, you have to have what? Children. And these children are harlots. We learned that a harlot in prophecy represents an apostate Christian church. Well, the question is, who are the daughters of the mother? We have a mother church, a harlot, but her daughters are also harlots. Who would these other churches be that are harlots? Well, first of all, is there a church that claims to be mother? Yes. Here's a statement from the book, The Faith of Millions, page 473, which says, quote, but since Saturday, not Sunday, is specified in the Bible, isn't it curious that non-Catholics who profess to take their religion directly from the Bible and not from the church observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Yes, of course, it's inconsistent. 
But this change was made about 15 centuries before Protestantism was born, and by that time, the custom was universally observed. Still is today, by the way. Reading on. They, non-Catholics, have continued the custom even though it rests upon the authority of the Catholic Church and not upon an explicit text in the Bible. That observance, Sunday observance, remains as a reminder of who? A reminder of the Mother Church, from which the non-Catholic sex broke away, like a boy running away from home, but still carrying in his pocket a picture of his mother or a lock of her hair. How interesting. The Church of Rome says, yeah, all these churches, they left us. They ran away from us. But we sent them a reminder of mother. What's the reminder of mother? Sunday observance. Sunday observance, the Church of Rome says, that's a reminder of the mother church, the picture of mother, the lock of her hair. So don't miss this. Any church that observes Sunday is a daughter of Rome, the mother church of Revelation 17. That's who all the harlots are. The daughters then are churches that came out of the mother church, Rome, but retain some of her same false doctrines or churches that have appeared more recently but have also followed the same false doctrines of the mother church. The mother church has all these daughters. There's a lot of them today. What does God think of this family of harlots, all these adulterous women? Let's read the answer from Revelation 14, verse 8. I promise you we would come back and look at this tonight. Revelation 14, verse 8. This is a warning from heaven, the second angel's message. Revelation 14, verse 8 says, And there followed another angel saying, Babylon. We've looked at Babylon. We now know who it is. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Babylon is the mother church. And all of her daughters. And God says Babylon is fallen. Fallen from Bible truth. Mother church is fallen from Bible truth. The daughter churches have fallen. Any church that keeps Sunday holy, fallen from Bible truth. There's another indictment against Babylon we find in Revelation 18. Turn over there. Revelation 18, 2 and 3. This is even more serious. Revelation 18, 2 says... Here's another message from heaven about Babylon. He cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation or the home of, of what? Devils. And the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean. There you see there, there, there's the unclean. And the cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Babylon has become the habitation of devils. I didn't say that. That's what God says. And I'm going to show you next week in our topic, Modern Magic, Miracles and the Occult, how this is actually happening today. There is stuff that's going on inside Christian churches that will make your hair stand up. Those of you that have hair. I'll show you a video clip next week when we talk about Modern Magic, Miracles and the Occult of what people are doing now in the name of religion in church. The Bible says Babylon has become the habitation of devils. Notice verse 3. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That's why there's so much religious confusion. All nations have drunk this wine. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. This harlot. And the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Go down now to verse 4. Revelation 18 verse 4 says... And I heard another voice from heaven, this must be God speaking, saying, come out of her, who? My people, that you be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. Do you know what God is saying here? God has people in Babylon. He's got people in the mother church, church of Rome. He's got people in the daughter churches, all these other churches that are breaking the commandments. And what does God say to his people that are in these churches? He says, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. What is sin? 
Sin is breaking God's law, 1 John 3, 4. Do churches teach people to break God's law? Yes. Some churches tell you it's okay to bow before an image. That's breaking the second commandment. Most churches tell you it's okay to break the fourth commandment, the Sabbath commandment. They say it doesn't matter. You can break that one. It's okay. God says, come out of that kind of church. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. Don't forget this. Someday soon, God is going to pour out the plagues on all these apostate churches that have been breaking his law every week and teaching people it's okay. God's going to pour out the plagues on these churches, Babylon. But before he does, he has people in all these churches. Some of you are his people. And he says to his people, come out of her, come out of Babylon, my people. I've often had people ask me, Pastor, would it be all right if I come to your church, the Seventh-day Adventist church on Saturday, and I'll go to my church on Sunday? Is that okay? I say, well, God himself has answered that question. God doesn't say stay in Babylon and clean up Babylon. God says... Come out of her, my people. Come out of the mother church, Church of Rome. Come out of the daughter churches, all these other apostate churches. To remain in Babylon is to partake of her sins and eventually receive of her plagues. And I was so thrilled the other night for those who responded to the invitation to be a part of God's end time true church. God has a true church today that meets the, the identifying marks found in the Bible, those eight identifying marks. We looked at that in our last meeting, and that is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I was thrilled for all those of you who have made a decision to be a part of God's true church at end time. Come out of Babylon and be a part of the truth, the pure woman. And I might mention just in passing, there are right here in Davao City about 70 Seventh-day Adventist churches. So there's probably one in the area where you live. In fact, there's a fairly large one very close to our FTC Tower here, the Camas Church. Some of you attend the Camas Church. But there's many, there's others, about 70 churches, Seventh-day Adventist churches right here in this one city. So you can find Seventh-day Adventist churches all over the world. And by the way, if you're watching on the internet or on television, you can find a Seventh-day Adventist church, no doubt, very close to where you live. God does have a church today, and he calls his people to come out of Babylon and be a part of his true church. I want to illustrate this with the, you may have heard of the old man of truth, Archaeologists, they dug up this stone you're seeing in the picture, round stone, round rock. What this rock may have been used for originally, nobody probably will ever know. But what is amazing is the face that's carved into this rock. It's almost as if those eyes are looking right at you. But what's even more amazing is the mouth. It's open. It's almost as if this rock is speaking to us. And according to the legend, the story of this rock, this rock represents the old man of truth. And according to the story, the old man of truth comes to every sincere person at some point during their life, between your, their birth and their death. If you are sincere, if you really are looking for the truth, at some point, the old man of truth will come walking into your life, according to the story. And when the old man of truth comes, the story says, don't let anyone turn you from him. Truth has come to your life, friend. It's come to your heart. You've learned the truth. And I want to encourage you to follow it. Jesus says in John 8, verse, verse 32, read with us. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Would you like to ask Jesus tonight to help you follow the truth that he's revealed to you? How many want to ask for his help to do that? Let me see your hand tonight. We're going to end our meeting with the song, this old hymn, Faith of Our Fathers. 
faith of our fathers living still in spite of dungeon fire and sword oh how our hearts beat high with joy whene'er we hear that glorious word let's stand together as we sing this hymn you can stand with us if you're watching in some other site as we pray our dear heavenly father again tonight we thank you for the holy bible the truths the teachings that we discover from your word where we have been misled we ask your forgiveness we've heard your call to come out of babylon out of religious confusion and to be a part of a commandment keeping church in these last days of earth's history, I pray your blessing on each one who's made that decision. We tonight pray that you'd help us to follow the truth you revealed to each of us. Bless those that are here, those that are watching. Give us the courage to stand boldly for what is right. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. No meeting here in this place tomorrow night. We'll meet you back on Friday for Modern Prophets, Visions, and Dreams. Six o'clock, we start, and I'll share my conversion story this Friday evening. God bless you.